welcome to Straight Talk with Carlissa Thorne. And I have with me once again the wonderful Mary C. Kelly, How to Start a Business for Veterans. And Mary C. Kelly brings a lot to the table because she has a lot of experience working with veterans. Not only that, she comes from a family that has been in the military and she's going to expand upon that. So I want people to understand that she can talk about this because she comes from a very long background of family in the military. So welcome Mary C. Kelly. Hey Carly, great to be with you yet again. I appreciate being on your show as always. So why don't we begin with you sharing a little bit about your background because I think it's very important for people who have not listened to many of our other previous podcasts, just a little bit about your background and then we'll go into what we'll be talking about today. Terrific, thank you for that. Well, you're right. So my older brother did um, 23 years as a, a marine helicopter pilot. His wife was in the Navy and um, she did active duty and then went reserves. Um, I did a total of 21 years commission time. Um, my husband was a Marine. My younger sister uh, did 20 years in the Air Force as a, as a communications officer. And my younger brother did, and her husband um, also did uh, five or six years of active duty time and then went reserves. And then my younger brother also did 10 years as a Navy pilot. So we have a lot of military background. And the only thing we don't have is Army and Coast Guard. So we're missing that. But but we've got uh, the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Air Force pretty well covered. So I always bring, we, we pretty much hang out at least once a month, and we talk a lot about having, experiencing, working with people, talking about veterans and transition. So today's topic is going to be talking about how veterans can actually literally develop a business. So that's what our topic is going to be today. So why don't you start, Mary? Well, terrific. As you know, Carly, I started my business when I got out of the Navy, but I think I had a little bit of an advantage that some people don't have, and I wanted to share with you why I think I had a little bit of an advantage. My advantage was I understood finances, and many people start a business and they don't realize how expensive it actually is to start a business. And the second thing that I had walking in was I had a plan for the financials for the first one year, three years, and five years of my business. And this is one of the mistakes I see with not just veterans, but everyone who starts, a, not everyone, but most people who start a business are surprised by how expensive it actually is and the amount of bookkeeping, accounting, and the places they get stuck when it comes time to the finances. And I just wanted to talk to your uh, audience a little bit and go over places where they can get unstuck and ways to make it easier. And I think that's important because I think a lot of people do get frozen. I do think a lot of people that I even talk to my clients, the minute you start talking about finances, I literally get the face of, seriously, they get frozen. They, a lot of people are, are in fear mode about money. And it is, I think, as you say, it's not that they're stupid. It's not that. It's, it's a lot of it that's misinformation. And I have to say a lot of it is from fear, from growing up, stories, seeing mom and dad fight about money, lack of money. Just a lot of you know like stories from childhood, and a lot of it, like I said, I think is a lack of education and miscommunication or misinformation. So I'd love for you now to inform us of finances, since you are a person that's educated in finances. Thank you. So the reason I say I had an advantage over other people is first off, my PhD is in economics, which means I've taken a lot of financial classes and I've taught financial classes. I've been a professor, as you know, for over 20 years and I was able to use that knowledge when it came time to planning my own business. So I think I was more fortunate than other people. The second thing is, and you hit on it, many of us learn about money when we heard our parents discuss money. And if our parents didn't talk to us about money, maybe we only heard the money discussions as it came through the walls. And so if your parents discussed money and maybe it was at a high decibel level, meaning they were arguing about money, money probably became some kind of emotional trigger for you or something you discussed only when there was going to be some kind of argument. And that's not the best way to discuss money. So let me just go into a personal financial moment there. If you've got if you've got the a normal couple, the number one thing couples in America fight about is money. And it's not necessarily because they don't have it. It's sometimes just about disagreements on how to spend it. So 
if you get a credit card in the mail and maybe your spouse has some charges on there that you didn't know about or you weren't expecting, when they walk through the door at the end of the day, maybe the kids are running around the house, the dog is barking, they come home, and you've got this credit card bill in your hand, and you kind of hold it up in your hand and you say, where in the world did this come from? What are you doing? Remember we said we were going to do this, and you go into attack mode. That's not the best way to attack a, a financial issue. A better way is you need to calm down before you can talk to somebody else about it, and then a better way is when they get home you might want to make a list. Hey, there's a few things I want to talk to uh, talk to you about our finances about and this credit card bill is one, maybe the electrical bill is another. And so I talk to my classes about it and I say try this. Go to your significant other and say, "Hey baby, I know you've had a long day. Why don't, why don't you let me get you a drink and let's take 15 minutes when you're ready and there's a couple issues on the finances I'd like to discuss when you're ready." Don't go into attack mode because that becomes an emotional trigger. But most of us, it's an emotional trigger. So one of the things as economists we have that advantage is for us, money is a tool. It's not necessarily an emotional trigger with most economists. So that's why I say I think I had a little bit of, a, of a, an advantage over other people when starting a business. And it's true. I'm going to say there's, there's two things. I think one of them, like I said, you have heard the decibel level. And the other one I've seen too is, the other side, the wealthy side, where people go, all people that are wealthy are either stingy or mean. Like, you know what I'm saying? There's, it's kind of interesting because I grew up with the other aspect, and I grew up in a very wealthy family, and I had, I had a different aspect where it was almost like the person that was wealthy was a very mean person. So it's, it's very interesting where I, I've seen both sides, where you also see a wealthy person who was also a very large giver. So it's kind of interesting where all the stories come from. It's like you said, it's either people are arguing about money, or you know, you see other people saying all money are not nice people. So it's interesting where all these stories come from. So oh, there is yeah. a, a large amount of stories that people start to develop around money. Absolutely. And if you look at it, people will say money corrupts. Absolutely. Or money is the root of all evil. Or wealthy people need to give more money away. Or wait a minute, where did this come from? First off. Um, you can't you can't make assumptions that because somebody started with nothing and they grew a fantastic business that they're somehow evil for doing that. The second thing is, if you grow a business and you hire other people and make them successful in the process, you're a good person. And number three, money's not bad. What you do with it and the choices you make with it. That is the determination. Money in itself is just a tool. It's like a hammer. You can't get emotional about a hammer. It's just a tool. But people do get emotional about money, and you're right. They actually do vilify people who are successful. But what's interesting is people will vilify business people for being successful, but very few people vilify Hollywood actors and actresses for making a ton of money for making a, a movie. I'm like, wait a second. It's much harder to build a business that grows people, gives them training, grows jobs, develops products that makes people's lives better. It's much more difficult to do that, in my mind, than to be an actor and actress in a Hollywood movie. But nobody ever says, oh gosh, those, those actors and actresses are just evil. Do you know what I mean? And it's interesting, because I've been in the entertainment business, and people have no idea what it's like to be in it. It's like, I love people to understand, is I really need to get the concept Walk a mile in someone's shoes before you judge. Another one I'd like just to throw in there, because we're actually discussing all these kind of, how would you say, archetypes, if you will, is you can't be spiritual and abundant at the same time. And I think that's a really hurtful one that people are really, they're actually really hurting themselves by now allowing themselves to be spiritual and abundant. Because I, I'd like people to really think about this. If you want to be spiritual and abundant, then go buy a forest. Get wealthy and then go give the and really do good with that money. It's like you know what I'm saying. I really want people to really start thinking about you know money. Like you said, money isn't a, it is not a bad thing. You can do so much good with that money and help other people. That's it. That's one of the things that I talk about in both the Money Smart book that you've talked about before on the show. The Money Smart: How Not to Buy Cat Food When You Don't Have a Cat. And the point there is once you've satisfied your basic needs then money is just a tool to help you do good things for other people. 
And that can be your family, that can be your friends, that can be your community, that can be the local no-kill animal shelter. It can be a variety of things. So you being successful means you can then do more to help other people. And that's one of the points we make in the business book as well, the 15 ways to grow your business in every economy book, is you have to be successful so that you can help other people be successful too. And we need people to be wildly successful because once you're wildly successful, now that's when you can really make a difference for other people. You can hire them, you can do great charity work, you can get more involved in the community, you can take time off, you can sponsor a little league team, you can do great work. Exactly, and that's why I love having you on. I, I love having you on month after month after month because you are a very valuable asset, I think, because you actually, all of your books are amazing. Every book is not just full of valuable tips and tools, they have humor in them. And, and they're very, in other words, they're very impactful, and they're done in a very succinct way. They're not huge books, they're small enough that they're very easy readable, they don't take a lot of time to read, and they're full of rich tips. Thank so you. So I much. love having you on. I love having every book is very valuable, and I just love having you on. So now let's get to some actual real tips and tools. Let's, so let's do get it. now down to we've actually. I love I love the fact that we actually tied in all these little archetypes, which archetypes, excuse me, which I thought were really valuable because people really do have all these fears and old storytelling that we we just you know have in our brains from childhood, just the things that are out there, Hollywood, mom, dad fighting and all that, which I thought was just fun to touch upon. And I'd love now to get into what we, what we decide to talk about, which how can veterans and not just veterans, other people build a business. And you have a plethora of resources, as Mary always does. So, um, and also, since we're on a podcast, let, let's tell people where they can find you so they can find your valuable books that you have on your website. And so let's go back to Mary, and Mary can tell us her website and where, she, where you can actually find all these wonderful tips and tools. Thank you so much, Carly, and it's always such a joy to be with you as well. So for your listeners, there's a place on my website where there are all of these forms. They're all free downloads. You don't log into anything. I don't ask for your information. No email, no stalking, nothing like that. It's just yours, and that's at ProductiveLeaders.com backslash free dash resources. And again, it's ProductiveLeaders.com backslash free dash resources. And if you get to just the ProductiveLeaders.com page, you can go to the spot that says free stuff, because I'm a high tech kind of person, free stuff. And you click on that, and all the resources are there. So some of the things I have for your folks today is number one, when we sit down with a business person, they frequently have a great idea. Terrific. So I asked some questions right at the beginning. What is your personal home budget? Can you afford to start this business right now? You may have to wait for six months and work at something else for six months or a year before you save up enough to start your own small business if that's what you want to do. But creating your own household budget is really important. So on the website, there's something called the monthly budget, and you input what you think you're spending every month, and then at the and then as the month goes by, you can track to see if you're on target. And it does all the math for you. You don't need to think too hard. You just input the numbers. There's the real numbers that actually happened, and then what you had planned. For so for example, sometimes we plan on spending three hundred dollars a month on groceries. But what actually happened is the entire family came to visit and we spent $600. So that's important to know. Many people, when they're doing a budget, get frozen, as you say, because they say, well, okay, um, it's November and that's when Thanksgiving's happening, so we're traveling, so this month doesn't count. Or next month is December, and then that's Christmas or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa, and um, we've got all kinds of presents that we've got to give to other people, and there's parties, and I need a new dress, so that month doesn't count. And then January, we have to pay all the bills, so that month doesn't count. And then February, and there's always a something. It's Valentine's Day, it's spring break, it's Easter, it's your birthday, it's your anniversary, it's June, we're taking big... There's never a normal month. And that's critical to understand because people frequently think they live on less money than they do, and they're wrong. You have to have a realistic picture of your actual expenditures so that you know whether or not you can afford to start your business. And doing a monthly budget for at least six months ahead of time, I think, is a great tool. 
Now you also have a couple of other really cool, really good resources. Now wait, wait. Now, now the book that you were telling me that you were you were talking about the titles has that one come out yet? The Money Smart book, or the Fifteen Ways book? The Fifteen Ways book. The Fifteen Ways book is is out. It looks like this. Um, oh, you came out. Oh yes. Oh yeah. Yay. Yep. And it has already won awards, so we're excited about that. And it is currently, I'm not sure how long it's going to be, a 99 cent Kindle download. So can you, name, can you actually put that up so you can see the whole title and say the name of that title? Sure. It's 15 Ways to Grow Your Business in Every Economy. It's on Amazon. It's on Kindle. It's currently a 99 cent download which is great because many of my business people wanted that and you can also get that on the website um, and bulk orders of course there's a discount which is great I have several small business owners 50 employees and less who are using the 15 chapters as a training module for their business so that's really nice to see. And then you have another one that you're working on that you're also talking about titles what about that one? Um, the Money Smart How Not to Buy Cat Food When You Don't Have a Cat is okay. how to get your finances under control. Okay. And, mm -hmm. Thank you for thank you for mentioning that. One of the other things I want to talk about for our small business people is their profit and loss statement for their business. In order for your business to be successful, you need to be making some kind of profit. Otherwise, it's a hobby. And I know that sounds harsh to say it out loud, but according to the IRS, you have to turn a profit every three out of five years for your business to be considered a business and not a hobby. So that means keeping a profit and loss statement. So keeping track of your expenditures is really important. Every time you spend money on your business, you should be tracking that and keeping track of it. So there's when you're first starting out, it's easy to do. You can get a paper calendar, you know, the kind that come coil bound or a desk calendar, and every time you have a business expense, keep the receipt, write the number down, write the amount down on your calendar, what it was for, Office Depot, Staples, for uh, paper, for toner, for something, whatever it is, or you paid somebody to do a graphic design, or you, whatever you did, write, actually physically write it down so that you have some kind of record. You can, you can get an expenditure book, you can do all that, you don't have to go high tech but you can also just use a monthly profit and loss statement and I've got that as a free download on the website as well and you can put in what you make that month and where that revenue comes from and then what your expenditures were what you spent money on and you can tell quickly if you're making money and I will tell you Carly one of the most interesting things when I talk to small business owners and again that's 20 million or below and sometimes it's a thousand dollars a month is I ask them are you making profit are you doing okay and the answer they frequently give me is, I don't know. It's very common. And I think a lot of times for the small business owner, it's because they don't consider their business a business. And, 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 I, and it's kind of funny because I find a lot of people that are actually entrepreneurs that are usually working for home don't usually consider themselves really working because they're working from home. You know what I'm saying? They don't take it as seriously because they're working from home. Does that make sense? It does, and there's a few things you can do for that. First off, set aside a small space in your house if you're just starting out. And we're not saying you know you should go off and, and buy an office building today. We're saying if you're going to do this, set aside a small space in your house. It can be a desk in the corner of a room. It can be anything where just business happens there. And if you're running a business from your home, which is great, treat it like a business. Get up every morning at 6 o'clock in the morning like normal have your coffee, get the kids off to school, feed the dog, take your walk, do whatever, and start working at a specific time. Give yourself a routine. This is again where people tend to get stuck. They think, oh, I can work from home, which means I've got all this free time. No, you don't. If this is a real business, you run it as a business. You get up, you get dressed, you have a schedule, and you work the schedule, just like a regular business. Otherwise, as my friend David Newman has, has, has said, and I'm fond of it, he says, random effort yields random results. So the same consistency that you're used to in your day job or in the military, getting up at a certain time, doing what you need to do, having that routine, really translates well into running a small business. And, and it's very true. Now, I'm going to say one other thing. It, it, 
yes, working from home can has some benefits. You can work different hours, meaning you have a little more flexibility, as long as you adhere to them. You know, I tend to work some crazy hours because I can, because I do work from home. However, it does not mean that I don't still work. And, you know, so yes, there are advantages in working home, meaning that you can work the hours you choose to work. However, that still means that you have to work. If that makes sense. <laughs> it absolutely does. And you're absolutely right. Working from home means if you've got kids in school and you want to work when they're in school, that's great. If you want to work after they've gone to bed, that's great. If you're a night person and you'd rather do research and work at night, perfect. That's great. But you have to make sure that you've got some level of consistency in your work week so that you are, in fact, doing the work necessary to create a profit for your business. Because again, when we look at our profits, that's our total revenue, everything we take in, subtracting, and we subtract from that our total costs. So a couple things, I'm going to get geeky on you. We've got our total fixed costs, which is everything we are always going to spend on our business. We bought the computer, that's a fixed cost. We are paying rent, that's a fixed cost. We have certain, maybe we've got accounting fees, legal fees, startup fees, our LLC, whatever. Those are all fixed costs. Those don't change based on the amount of business we do per month. But then we have our variable costs, and that could be your travel, your transportation, your office supplies, people you pay if you're paying people on a wage level. Those are all variable costs. So your variable costs are where a lot of people get into trouble because they, they fail to consider how much that can change month to month. But the other place people get in trouble is once they've made that purchase of say a new computer and a printer and a scanner and office supplies and all that they fail to count that into what their overall expenditures are as total costs so you add your total fixed costs and your variable costs together and that gives you your total costs for the month and then you subtract that from your revenue and if that's if your revenue is more than your cost you're making a profit and that's what we want to see exactly and it sounds yeah. really basic, but but it sounds really basic, but many people simply don't do that simple math part because as they're getting into it, they think, well, I'll just absorb this, I'll absorb this. And the one place that I want people to get unstuck and unfrozen is creating a separate business credit card and a separate business bank account. It can be under the umbrella of your other bank account, but have that business credit card just for business expenses. That helps a lot. And when you've got that, especially at the end of the year when you do taxes or if you miss writing something down, you can just go and check that particular credit card. I put all of my business expenses on one credit card, every bit, every penny. If I'm taking a client out for coffee and it's $4, I put it on that credit card because that's the only way I can keep track of all of the business expenses. And exactly, that actually is the best idea ever because the minute you start commingling, it gets very hard to remember to go to your other, it's really hard to remember to check off, you know, that means you have to actually check two statements and it gets really hard then to remember, oh, I use this card. If you just keep them totally separate, there's no errors. The minute you, by accident, use the other card, you're not going to remember. So keeping two separate yeah. cards makes it really easy that you don't have to have any, you don't have any errors. It's, it just makes it very, very simple and easy. And you know, people are more responsive, Carly, to colors than anything else. So I make sure my business card is a completely different color from my personal card. And then I have an emergency card just for backup, but it's completely different color, so I don't have to think. I know specifically that color, what it looks like in the wallet, and if it's business, it's black. If it's personal, it's green, and that's it's just that easy. So that's um, a, a tip I wanted to share. The other aspect is many people wonder how they're going to finance their business. So if you're going to buy a franchise, let's say you're going to buy a restaurant franchise, that generally does mean a loan. To get that loan, that will mean a business plan, which we've discussed on the show previously, and we're going to discuss that at, at a future date a little bit more in depth as well. But the business plan does have to have some kind of financial component. That financial component this is where a lot of people who write business plans for a living and charge for it, this is where they really make their money, but you do all the work. You have to show your own monthly budget and that profit loss statement and a projected 
profit loss statement. So those forms that I have on the website can be very helpful because if you're looking to get a business loan, that's the information the financial institutions, the banks, are going to need from you. So that's just there to be helpful. You can attach that with your normal um, business plan that you're going to submit for financing purposes if you need that. But the other way many small businesses get started financially is they finance themselves. So if you are going to finance your business, I encourage you again, keep the accounts separate. If you're going to give yourself a loan to start your business, treat it like a loan from someone else. And what I mean by that is say, all right, I've got $20,000 and I'm going to allocate the money a certain way. If it's just your money and you're tapping into your savings to do that, we frequently don't plan for that. And people get in trouble because they keep dipping into their own savings, their own savings, and all of a sudden they're surprised when their savings has been depleted, their spouse is mad at them, and the kids now can't go to college or whatever. You need to make sure you treat a loan to your business as a business loan from someone else. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, we are running out of time as usual. And I do want to, our next, our next conversation, I really do want to talk about the loan aspect because I don't think there are a lot of people that do not understand the loan aspects, especially I do want to get into a little bit of the credit score aspect because a lot of people understand if you are going to get into the loan aspects, especially if you're going to go get a loan, um, you do need to have a decent credit score to get a loan for your business. And a lot of people don't understand the whole credit score thing and what a FICO means or, you know, but they don't understand any of that. They don't understand oh. what a credit score is, what FICO means, they don't understand what it takes to get a loan. Um, and like you said, they don't even understand what you just said about actually treating you taking out of your savings and treating taking a loan out for yourself, for your business, what any of that means. So I do want to actually get into a discussion a little bit about the financial aspects of actually taking out loans for a business. So that I think is going to be our next conversation. I love it. As always, our time always goes so fast and you're always so fun to talk to. But I think that's a great idea for our next program is if you are preparing to start a business or even make that transition, making sure your credit score is credit worthy and we can, I think I've got five or ten tips on how we can increase your credit score and things to look for and I can explain that and we can do that next time. I know you can. <laughs> so, so once again, please tell everyone who you are and where they can find you. Thanks, Carly. Again, this is Mary Kelly. You can email me if you have any other questions at mary at productiveleaders.com and I have free resources for you at productiveleaders.com backslash free dash resources or just productiveleaders.com and you'll find the free resources. I think that's easier. Just go to productiveleaders.com and go to free stuff. That's it. <laughs> there. Thank you so much, Carly, again for having me on. It's always such a pleasure. Absolutely. Well, you've been on Straight Talk with Carly Alyssa Thorne, and you've been with your host, Carly Alyssa Thorne, and you can always find me at carlyalyssathorne.com. And as usual, it's been a delight being with you, and I hope everybody has a beautiful evening, and it's, as usual, been a delightful time having the Mary C. Kelly with me. I love having her on. It's always wonderful, very enjoyable learning environment, and I always learn, as, I always learn a lot myself, and I hope you all learned a lot as well, and I look forward to being with you next week. Enjoy, everyone. <laughs>